Hi, I'm Dr. Paula Rosen, publisher of Education Update, and I'm delighted to be here with Dr. Harold Koplowitz, who is the president of the Child Mind Institute here in New York City. We have some compelling questions to find out more about what's happening with our children in this nation. Dr. Koplowitz, what is the mission of the Child Mind Institute? And we're a relatively young organization. In fact, we just celebrated our first anniversary. And we have a very big mission. Our mission is to transform mental health care for the world's children to fulfill their full potential. And what I mean by that is that in this country alone, we have 15 million children who have a real psychiatric disorder, and less than half of them get help. What we want to do is change the way we deliver the care, how we identify kids who have these problems, and we want to improve the treatments that are out there and also find new treatments so that kids can really do well at work, which is school, at love, which is most times their parents and their family, and in play, which is hobbies or sports or activities with their friends, because that's really what every child and every parent wants for their child, is to have full lives. How do you plan to do identification? Well, I think the most important piece is that diagnosis in child mental health still is being done the old-fashioned way, which is taking a history. And in medicine, even, in fact, in all parts of medicine, history taking is clearly the most important um, instrument we have. So that if you're speaking to uh, a man in his 50s who has pain in his chest that's radiating down his left arm, you are concerned that it might be um, some kind of uh, heart attack, some kind of myocardial infarction, that the muscle of the heart is not getting the kind of blood supply we want. But there are many, many ways that we can test that hypothesis because we have, um, uh, we have instruments that can take pictures of the heart. We have ways of looking inside the heart. And we are getting there with the brain. And what we are looking for is a new way of making these diagnoses. So we have started something called the Healthy Brain Network. And the Healthy Brain Network is an idea of taking 10,000 kids and putting them into a, f uh, a functional MRI, which is different than structural MRI. A functional MRI is a, a uh, imaging uh, machine that actually can tell you how the brain is functioning, not how it's structured, but how it's functioning. And we have figured out that if you let a child stay at rest, it actually the brains of kids who have ADHD or have autism or have anxiety talk to itself, the brain talks to itself, differently than a typical child. So the metaphor for that would be the post office. When the post office is closed, there's a lot of activity still going on. There are people inside there moving the mail around, sorting it, getting ready for the time when the post office opens up. And when it opens up, sometimes there's not much activity. They're just selling a few stamps, people are waiting online. That's somewhat what happens with the brain, that when the brain's at rest, we can actually see some real differences. So if we could get 10,000 kids from across the world to lie in a machine and get these kinds of pictures, this would be the equivalent of what the growth charts are like when you go to the pediatrician. So that when you take the height and weight of your child, it's very important to put them on that chart so you know, are they at the 50th percentile, are they at the 99th percentile, are they at the 10th percentile? And so you can follow what healthy growth and weight is for a child. We need to do that for the brain. And then we need to find a group of kids who have specific disorders and see how their brains are different in their development than typical kids. This sounds like fascinating new evidence in the field. Am I correct? This is new. Well, this is truly going to be a game changer in many ways because mm -hmm. what we're also trying to encourage our scientists who are going to be working with us is to break down silos. So traditionally, you would have a scientist at Columbia or a scientist at UCLA or someone at Harvard, and they wouldn't share their data until they had published it. Yes. And what we want is a group of scientists who are part of our scientific research council from 10 different institutions and with expertise in many different areas to be able to collaborate with each other and to be able to put their data online even before they use it so that this way we can speed up the process. In many ways, child psychiatric disorders is the last frontier. If you think about uh, heart disease, uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it, it, people who got a heart attack became cardiac cripples. 
they, if they survived, they were never the same. Today with stents, today with new kinds of medications, with bypass surgery, we can really change the world. We haven't been able to do that yet with psychiatry. And we also know that 75% of serious psychiatric illness occurs before the age of 24, 50% before the age of 14. The biggest bang for the buck that we can get is finding treatments that will work on kids early because the trajectory of their lives will be totally different if you can eliminate these symptoms that really are barriers to learning, barriers to play, barriers to leading fulfilling lives. It sounds to me like there are also going to be financial benefits for the nation if you, if you can treat these symptoms and the, and the uh, illness when an early onset uh, and uh, then you have functioning uh, individuals and adults. So, so could you translate but, that but, into so money, into the dollars? I, I think truly, while child psychiatric illness is misunderstood, there are many myths about it, it doesn't really make a difference what your political affiliation is. This is good for our nation. Whether you are just a liberal who cares desperately about you know, the good of the children's lives and clearly doesn't want them to suffer, mental health is good for our children because therefore they'll do better in school, they'll, they're more likely to graduate, they're less likely to drop out and get involved in illegal activities. And you are a fiscal conservative, it is good for us to find more solutions, again, for good mental health for our kids because if you do stay in school and you do graduate, your chances of paying taxes and becoming a contributor to society are much greater than if you find school so frustrating because you can't sit still or you're too anxious to attend, then once you drop out, you're more likely to use illicit drugs, you're more likely to land up going to jail and frankly becoming someone who takes from society than someone who's able to contribute. Question about the MRIs that you just spoke about. Will that research and those tools be able to tell us, okay, this child has ADHD, this child is susceptible to autistic tendencies. Will those MRIs be able to differentiate between some of the diagnoses we have out there now? All right, so I, I think that the holy grail has always been the blood test. So what do I mean by that? If you have a very bad cough and you are hacking away and your bo it bothers you tremendously and you go to the doctor, before he even takes a chest x-ray, if you have a fever and you have a cough and he takes a blood test, depending on what your white blood cells look like, we can tell whether or not you have a virus or whether you have a bacterial infection. If you have a virus, we can tell the patient, take some, drink plenty of fluids, stay in bed, you will live longer than the virus. The virus will end in 24 hours and just be comfortable. If it's a bacterial infection, we know there's specific antibiotics that you can take and that you have to take to make sure that it doesn't get worse. In psychiatry, we're not going to be able to get that specific blood test, but what we will be able to get are biomarkers. And so that if we can be able to tell the difference between the brain of a child who's typical versus the brain of a child who has autistic tendencies on the Asperger autism spectrum disorder versus a child with ADHD, that becomes the confirmation of a diagnosis. And that in itself, I think, would be very reassuring for parents because I think one of the hardest things parents have is A, accepting a child has one of these disorders, and B, the treatment. Very rarely has there been more controversy than the idea of medication for psychiatric disorders. Instead of embracing them and saying, how wonderful that we have a, a group of medications that can help children sit and focus and be less impulsive, not sit as still or be as um, attentive as an average group of kids, but enough so that they can function in school and use the IQ points that they do have. Instead, parents and many people in the public think that somehow that's cheating mm -hmm. or that's teaching children to use drugs. Mm -hmm. And even though the facts on this are completely uh, against that, that they say that in fact we know the kids who are adequately medicated for ADHD early are less likely to use illicit drugs later. Kids who are uh, you know, properly medicated for depression are again less likely to medicate themselves later. This myth doesn't seem to leave the public. And the public is so convinced that we are over-diagnosing, over-medicating children that parents are very resistant to getting their children the help they need. 